Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name's Nick Reardon, and uh, this is uh, the Che Alaska <laughs> teleconference. I'm just noticing there's a couple of lines unmuted as you guys pop in. Maybe just take one second and uh, to to mute those, and uh, we'll we'll get rolling here. Yeah, welcome, uh, welcome to today's Alaska Collaborative on Health and the Environment webinar. Uh, this. This session is entitled oh, Protecting Your Child's Health with Dr. Ruth Etzel. So my name is Nick Reardon, and on behalf of Alaska Community Action on Toxics, I'll be hosting today's See. webinar. And uh, yeah, I'm calling in from Anchorage, Alaska. This is where ACAD is based, and it's also the traditional and unceded lands of the Denina people. And so I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank the stewards of these lands, uh, along with those of the many places that uh, all of you, our guests, are are calling in. So for those of you new to these gatherings, Che Alaska, it's a regional partner of a national collaborative on health and the environment. And that's the abbreviation CHE. So together, Che and Che Alaska work to advance knowledge and action uh, to address the growing concerns around links between human health and environmental factors. It looks like I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining this is, this is my error in, in, not, uh, in not setting up the programming right here, but the, there are a few lines uh, that aren't muted. So folks can just find that button and, uh, and mute themselves. I know this is, uh, this is probably something that often is just set up right at the beginning. But so if you wanna learn more about these programs, the Che and Che Alaska, we both got websites. So akaction.org and healthandenvironment.org. And um, yeah, as usual, our session will last one hour and focus on a presentation from our guest uh, followed by questions. So you can keep your microphone muted and type those questions into the chat box at any time during the meeting. And we'll get to those in the second half of the hour. So now on to our guest today, Dr. Ruth Etzel. She is an internationally recognized pediatrician, environmental epidemiologist, and preventative medicine specialist. And her previous roles and in research include leading the World Health Organization's efforts to protect children from environmental hazards, uh, as well as investigating the effects of environmental contaminants on children and studying the health effects of exposure to indoor and outdoor air pollutants. That list could go on and on. Um, I'd also like to note that she's no stranger to Alaska, having lived in Bethel in 1979 for a short stint um, as a medical student and returning for the month of January in Bethel <laughs> to cover Dr. Ron Brennan's pediatric practice um, while he prepared to run the Iditarod. Um, She's actually adopted, we were just chatting, adopted one of Dee Dee John Rose's sled dogs and moved to Anchorage in 2001 to take a position as medical director of research at our South Central Foundation uh, here in Anchorage. So, um, and this is also not the first time that Dr. Etzel has shared her ex expertise through the Alaska Collaborative on Health and the Environment. She moderated a call in 2006 on persistent organic pollutants uh, was a guest in 2014 for a discussion um, of the latest science uh, and advocacy surrounding children's environmental health and uh, was a part of ACAT's Children's Environmental Health Summit. So um, no, no, no shortage of experience here and we're, we're so good, we're so glad to, to be joined again by uh, yeah, Dr. Ruth Etzel. So now on to the reason we're here today. Uh, welcome so much, Dr. Etzel, and um, yeah, take it away. All right. Well, thank you, Nick, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be back in Alaska, even if only virtually. Um, I'd like to thank Pam Miller and Nick Reardon for inviting me to join you today, and uh, I also wanted to give out a short shout out to Vi, Vi Wapii, because I heard that she was appointed last month to the President's Environmental Justice Advisory Committee, which is huge. So Vi, congratulations. Oh, thank you. I have no disclosures to report or conflicts of interest to resolve. And uh, this presentation represents my views and not necessarily those of any organization with which I have been affiliated. So I've been working on children's environmental health now for quite some time. 
um, when I was first at back in 1995, I decided that what was most needed in the field at that time was a single resource for pediatricians so they could consult it whenever they had questions about child health and the environment. Along with Dr. Sophie Falk, I worked to develop the Green Book, which is shown on this slide. And it's now considered the go-to source for doctors who care for children. It's been distributed to pediatric residents, to all members of Congress, and even translated into Mandarin for use by doctors in China. After the Green Book, Phil Landrigan and I put together a book for students in schools of public health. And that book is shown here. This was published in 2014. It doesn't have the kind of clinical details that doctors need, but instead it focuses on the body of scientific research showing the hazards to children's health from a variety of environmental chemicals and hazards. And then earlier this year, the American Academy of Pediatrics published this book for parents. It comes out of the fourth edition of the Green Book and basically includes the frequently asked questions that many parents may have, along with responses drawn from the American Academy of Pediatrics in that book. The question and answer format has some advantages, but it also has a downside, which is that these issues may appear to be much simpler than they actually are. All of us who work on environmental issues know that these are really nuanced and complex issues. And a question and answer format might lead some people to think that there's only one correct answer, although we know that's rarely the case. It also can hide the context in which environmental contamination affects children. And finally, this format can make it appear that the solution to environmental problems belongs in the hands of individuals. One of the major lessons I learned during my years in Alaska is to appreciate that the values of many in the Alaska Native community, especially the Alaska Native elders, were very different from the values of many non-Native researchers. This slide is a bit of an oversimplification, but it helps to illustrate that, for example, traditional Alaska Native communities may value sharing, whereas non-Native researchers value ownership. Alaska Native communities value cooperation, whereas non-Native researchers value competition. And Alaska Native communities value humility, whereas non-Native researchers may value achievement. And Alaska Native communities value responsibility to the community, whereas non-Native researchers may value individualism. So I wouldn't want anyone to come away thinking that the solution to environmental problems is in the hands of individual parents or families. But protecting the environment is, as Alaska Native elders believe, our responsibility to our communities. I also wouldn't want anyone to think that environmental problems can be addressed out of context. And that context includes the historical trauma and injustices that have been heaped on the shoulders of Alaska Native and American Indian communities and communities of color. And to illustrate that context, I'd like to reflect on some of the injustices of this past year. I cannot stop thinking about the police violence in Minneapolis that resulted in the death of Mr. George Floyd. His death and the deaths of so many other people reported in its wake highlighted for everyone the prevalence of <laughs> systemic racism is racism that is pervasively and deeply embedded in laws, policies, entrenched practices and establish beliefs and attitudes that produce, condone, and perpetuate widespread unfair treatment of Native people and other people of color. Although we know that an officer was held accountable, 
It was in a single trial, after a single death, in a single city. And many people have pointed out that it takes much more than a single verdict to change the entire system. Why? It's important to change the underlying system because otherwise the system itself will continue to produce these injustices. In this country, we often deal with chemicals and environmental damage without looking at this systematically. These are not simply technical issues to be resolved by science, but they're much more like injustices. After all, take a look at who experiences the worst health outcomes from environmental contamination. Drawing on the concept of systemic racism, we can observe that systemic pollution is the norm in our country. It's considered okay that pollution occurs in the pursuit of economic growth and that where it lands is just unfortunate. We focus on quantifying individual chemicals and this can be a distraction which can obscure the processes and structures of power that generate that pollution. The chemical by chemical approach can take our attention away from who produces the pollution and who bears the burden of that pollution. And I, I'd like to mention the implications of this for our field. In environmental health, our predominant model has been to focus on getting a sufficient body of evidence on each individual chemical in order to make a case for removal of that chemical from a product or from a process. But waiting for children to become ill and then investigating why they got sick is a terrible way to ensure a safe environment for future generations. First, our surveillance systems, the records that health officials keep of deaths and illnesses in their jurisdictions, often avoid environmental diseases. And even when a medical professional reports a cluster of disease that might be linked to the environment, it's extremely hard to make the link between the cluster and exposures to chemicals in the environment. There are methodological issues with exposure assessment, and few studies are able to definitively show that a chemical is a bad actor. It's a high bar. So wouldn't it be better to consider that we are food eaters and air breathers, and that our food, water, and air should be clean? We think we can retrofit the existing economic system to deal with chemicals, but that very system produces the and injustices that we see today. The industry decisions that poison communities are made behind closed doors, undemocratically. And these decisions are not random. They're often based on imbalances of political power because it's easier to pollute in communities without a lot of power since they don't put up much resistance. We are witnessing a form of slow violence where people are dying, but we just don't see it happening. Environmental injustice is killing tens of thousands over decades, yet it's difficult to see. The writer Rob Nixon suggests that's because it's slow violence that occurs gradually out of sight with delayed effects dispersed across time and typically not seen as violence. To illustrate the situation, I thought I'd tell you a story about the health impact of mold. When I worked in Alaska, I would ask the Alaska Native leaders about their views on various environmental problems. And one of the top problems they would always mention was mold. As those of you who live in Alaska now know, the amount of rainfall received by the state has been steadily increasing. This slide shows the increase in rainfall from 1969 to 2018. Rain increased by more than 17% in the YK Delta 
by 8.8% in the Fairbanks area and by 10 to 15% in Southeast Alaska, while it increased by only 3.4% around Anchorage. Even people living in the lower 48 remember the torrential rains in Haines just four months ago. The left side of the slide shows the 48 hour rainfall totals for a number of places in Southeast Alaska. The village of Pelican had 11.7 inches of rain and the Haines Airport had 8.6 inches of rain. That is a lot of water. The health impacts of floods are many. There are immediate deaths and injuries, as well as non-specific increases in mortality and increases in the risk of preterm birth. The risk of some infectious diarrheas and respiratory diseases may go up, and there can be exposure to toxic substances and mental health effects like post-traumatic stress disorder. Floodwaters can reach heights of four to six feet in some homes, and once the water recedes, the task of cleaning up the debris is often left to the occupants. And one issue that can remain if the cleanup doesn't happen quickly enough is the growth of a variety of fungi or molds. Pardon me, Ruth. I don't, sorry to interrupt. Um, I was just getting a comment, but um, could you speak up just a little bit? I think for some folks, um, anyway, yeah. Could you just speak well, a little I'll louder? i speak louder. That's great. Thank can you, you so much. Can you hear me better now? So do you remember the nursery rhyme about the little girl with a little curl right in the middle of her forehead? You remember when she was good, she was very, very good. But when she was bad, she was horrid. Well, the fungi can be like that. When they're good, like these tasty morels, they're very, very good. But when they're bad, like this amanita, they're horrid. Let's start with the very, very good. Well, there's penicillin. It doesn't get much better than that. And cyclosporin and ergot alkaloids, all are useful drugs which are derived from molds. But molds also have their They have some harmful effects. The allergic effects of molds can result in recurrent cough, for example, after exposure to the common household mold, cladosporium. There are also invasive fungi, such as aspergillus, that can cause pneumonia in patients with cancer. And then there are the toxic molds that can produce very potent poisons. We call these the toxigenic molds. There are four well-known toxic effects of exposure to molds. The most prominent is bleeding. This is one effect of T2 toxin, a mycotoxin that is considered a potential biological warfare agent. A second toxic effect is cancer, for example, liver cancer from exposure to aflatoxin. A third is suppression of immunity, for example, from cyclosporin, which is used clinically for that effect. And finally, some mycotoxins can cause vomiting. From time to time, you'll hear about outbreaks of vomiting among dogs when commercial dog food is, con is contaminated with vomitoxin. Molds and mushrooms are both fungi, and both include some poisonous varieties. Amanita produces poisons that can result in death within four to seven days after eating these mushrooms. The mortality rate is five to 10%. Toxic molds are molds with poisons on the surface of their spores. For example, species of Stachybotrys produce toxins that can be harmful if breathed, eaten, or even rubbed on the skin. Exposures to molds have been implicated in a cluster of infants who were previously healthy and then suddenly stopped breathing. Imagine how terrifying this was for their parents. An example of this was a one-month-old infant who suddenly had trouble breathing. He was a full-term, healthy baby with no prior problems, and in the morning, he vomited at home and then became very fussy and difficult to console. That afternoon, he started breathing rapidly and grunting. When he arrived at the emergency room, he was pale and cyanotic with nasal flaring and rib retractions. He had no fever and he was lethargic and non-responsive to pain. His extremities were cool and mottled. 
an ER doctor inserted a breathing tube and immediately suctioned a moderate amount of bright red blood. This was an indication that the infant had lung bleeding as the cause of his breathing problems. His doctor didn't know what caused this problem. He considered whether this baby's condition was caused by some infectious cause or maybe a toxic cause. To sort this out, bacterial cultures were obtained from the blood, urine, spinal fluid, and trachea. All were negative for infectious agents. Viral cultures from the throat were also negative. A home inspection by an industrial hygienist revealed water damage and fungal growth in the attic and in the baby's bedroom closet. And the toxic fungus, funga, fungus Sacchibatris, was found in the air, in dust, and on the infant's crib and mattress and in the furnace filter. The word mycotoxin comes from myco, meaning fungus, and toxin, meaning naturally produced poison. There are 350 to maybe 400 known mycotoxins, and they probably evolved as a means of protection from insects, microorganisms, nematodes, grazing animals, and humans. Perhaps it was some sort of a chemical defense system. Mycotoxins had not been linked to child health problems in the U.S. until a series of events in Cleveland, Ohio. Pediatric doctors in Cleveland's large clinic hospital began noticing an unusually large number of infants being hospitalized with acute pulmonary hemorrhage. They admitted 10 infants with this problem in two years, compared with only three in the previous 10 years. Now, infant lung bleeding is very rare. There are no data from the United States, but a study in Sweden estimated that it occurred in one child out of every four million children. That would mean that the number of cases of infant bleeding in Cleveland was far more than would be expected by chance. A typical infant would suddenly have blood coming from the nose or mouth and then stop breathing. Usually, once the infants got in the emergency room and were put on a breathing machine, they rapidly improved. And most were able to return to their own homes within a few days. But one of the infants died suddenly at night, right after returning home from the hospital. And his death was called sudden infant death syndrome. So this shows a map of Cleveland. And the children's hospital there cares for infants from all over the state of Ohio. But you can see that the, <coughs> that the red dots which are infants with lung bleeding, are all clustered in one area of the city. This was one of the poorer areas of the city. So an emergency investigation was started to find out why this was happening there. 10 babies with lung bleeding, these were the cases, were each matched with three comparison babies from the same geographic area. These were the controls. Their parents were asked a large number of questions about what the baby drank, what the baby wore, where the baby went and who the baby was with. There was also a medical record review and blood specimens were taken. In both groups, many of the families were on Medicaid with maternal age in the early 20s and maternal education having finished 11th grade. Most were male and most were black. In a matched analysis, infants with lung bleeding were 16 times more likely to live in a home with water damage and 33 times more likely to have a family member who also coughed up blood. The infants with acute pulmonary hemorrhage were more likely than controlled infants to live in homes which had had chronic roof leaks, plumbing leaks, and flooding problems. And this area of the city had recently experienced a 100-year flood. In the homes, some of the walls looked like this. The black substance you see could easily be mistaken for dirt. But if you take a piece of scotch tape and place it against the wall and put it under a microscope, you can see that the typical tulip structure of this indicates that it is stachybotrys mold. This mold is usually found only in places with chronic water damage. It looks black and slimy when wet and dusty when dry. 
It will grow on waterlogged paper, cardboard, wood, or under carpeting. But the growth of this toxic mold can be prevented by cleaning up water within 24 hours of a flood or a leak. For those of you who like data, here are the odds ratio for the fungi that were measured in the air of the study homes. You can see that all of the odds ratio are about one, except for Stachybotrys, which was almost 10 times higher in the homes of the infants with lung bleed than in the homes of the control infants. So this emergency field study found that many molds were present in the homes, but Stachybotrys was more commonly found in the homes of infants with pulmonary hemorrhage than in control infants' homes. Five of nine cases versus four of 27 controls. When these findings were released, there was quite a lot of concern from industry and a lot of confusion about causality. Did the exposure to Stachybotrys and other fungi cause the pulmonary hemorrhage in these babies? Of course, environmental scientists are no strangers to controversy. This cartoon says the scientific community is divided. Some say this stuff is dangerous. Some say it isn't. So these are the Bradford Hill factors or criteria. And these factors have been used by epidemiologists for many years as a way of assessing the evidence supporting an association between an exposure and an outcome. They include the strength of the association, the consistency, its specificity, its temporality, any dose response information, the plausibility of the association, its coherence with other findings, and any experimental evidence available. Let's look at these one by one. First is the strength of the association. That is, how high is the relative risk or odds ratio for this association? In this study, as I mentioned, the matched odds ratio for a change of 10 units in the mean concentration of stachybotrys was 9.83. A reanalysis of the study was performed by persons uninvolved with the research to try to assess how robust this was. They used different assumptions, excluded data from several control infants, and employed different values for airborne fungal concentrations. Not surprisingly, this reanalysis yielded a diminished odds ratio of 1.9, but this was still statistically significant. So there is a strong association. A second factor is consistency. Has the association been repeatedly observed by different investigators in different places, under different circumstances, and at different times? Several case reports have been published. A case of acute pulmonary hemorrhage in a North Carolina infant was associated with exposure to a moldy home from which trichoderma, a toxigenic fungus like Stachybotrys, was isolated. And acute pulmonary hemorrhage also occurred in infants in Kansas City, Delaware, and 20 more cases in Cleveland. And then there's the report of a seven-year-old boy in Texas with pulmonary hemosiderosis whose doctor was able to isolate stachybotrys from the fluid in his lungs. More than 100 reports of infants with acute pulmonary hemorrhage were received from physicians across the United States in the late 1990s. 15% of the infants died suddenly, but the proportion that were linked to toxic molds is not known. So there's some consistency. A third factor is specificity. That is, does exposure to a particular agent cause just one type of disease at a particular site? The effects of exposure to toxigenic molds appear to be dependent on the route of exposure. Inhalation is linked to specific effects on the lungs, while ingestion leads to specific effects on the GI tract and dermal exposure affects the skin. So there is some specificity. What about a temporal relationship? Does the exposure occur before the disease? Here we have evidence that infants who recovered from episodes of lung bleeding and returned to their homes had recurrence of their lung bleeding shortly after returning home. 
One infant rebled four times, once within only four hours of being discharged home. So there's evidence of a temporal relationship. Let's look at whether there's evidence of a dose response relationship. That is, do those with higher exposure have higher risk of disease? Here we have information only from animal models. In infant animals, when a dose of 400,000 spores per gram was instilled in the trachea of infant rat pups, 73% of the pups suffered fatal pulmonary hemorrhage. When the dose was increased to 800,000 spores per gram, 83% of the rat pups suffered fatal pulmonary hemorrhage. But we don't have any information about dose response in human infants. So there's some limited evidence of dose response in animals. What about biological plausibility? Is the causation biologically plausible? We know that these spores can get into the airways and affect the lungs. In fact, in one study, spores consistent with stachybotrys were observed at autopsy in a sample of preserved lung tissue of an infant who died from a massive pulmonary hemorrhage. So there is some evidence of biologic plausibility. What about coherence? Does this fit with other evidence from diverse disciplines? Mycotoxicosis in horses was first reported in 1931 in the Ukraine. Massive numbers of horses died with gastrointestinal bleeding. In fact, Stalin had the veterinarians, veterinarians rounded up and thrown into prison because he thought they had poisoned the horses, but they had not. The horses had simply eaten hay that was heavily contaminated with the stachybotrys mold. Elementary toxic eleuchia is a disease of humans that first appeared in far eastern Siberia and is said to have been responsible for the deaths of at least 100,000 Russian people between 1942 and 1948. They develop necrotic ulcers in the mouth, throat, nose, stomach, and intestines. They also have bleeding from the nose, mouth, GI tract, and kidneys. This condition, elementary toxic eleuchia, was associated with eating grains such as wheat and corn that had been under snow the previous winter, and the grains were contaminated with fusarium and stachybotrys, which both produce potent mycotoxins. So there's some evidence of coherence. And finally, what about any experiments? Does modification of the putative cause modify the outcome? There was a significant reduction in recurrent pulmonary hemorrhage following the recommendation that infants with pulmonary hemorrhage be removed from the residence in which the infant was living when the hemorrhage occurred. Before routine recommendation to move, five of seven infants had recurrent pulmonary bleeding. After the recommendation to move, one of 23 had recurrent pulmonary bleeding. So there's some evidence from this intervention. Looking at all the Bradford Hill factors, there is evidence of strength of the association, a little evidence of consistency with other studies, specificity, temporality, and dose response. There's strong evidence of plausibility and coherence, and a little evidence from an intervention that happened in Cleveland. Taken together, it shows sufficient evidence of an association between molds and infant pulmonary hemorrhage, enough to take protective action. So it's a top priority for pediatricians to protect the health of children. And given that this condition had a 10% fatality rate, the pediatricians felt like a cautious approach was warranted. And they advised that infants should not live in moldy homes. But CDC had a different approach. CDC contended that the association was still not proven. This is a different management approach. 
After careful investigation, the mold, which is the offender here, was found not guilty by the government. When reviewing the context, there appear to be several considerations. One important consideration is the power of special interests compared to the lack of power of black infants. In this country, there are well-established systemic problems with both police violence and environmental violence. Police violence may happen fast, while environmental violence can be slow. Both are rarely investigated, rarely proven, and most often occur among people without political power. We often use this schematic to describe the situation that we face. The child is here in the middle. On the right is child health. And on the left are some environmental factors that influence a child's health. These include poverty and environmental degradation, racism, poor nutrition, poor housing, and even advertising. In the healthcare system, we intervene here on the right, taking care of broken bones and administering vaccinations and trying to keep the child well. But healthcare doesn't often address these underlying factors that lead to disease. To address these factors, we need advocates who can bring these issues up with policymakers and legislators. And we rarely look even further upstream to ask who is producing the poverty, the environmental degradation, the racism, the poor nutrition, the poor housing, and the advertising. The industries that produce these conditions are often obscured. Do you recognize this photo? This is a photo of New York City on Earth Day, April 22nd, 1970. Millions of people poured into the streets. In fact, they had to close Fifth Avenue because the crowd was overwhelming. People came from all walks of life, from urban and rural communities, young and old, from across the political spectrum. An estimated 10% of the population of the United States poured into the streets of America in 1970. So it got me to wondering, why is it so difficult to mobilize people about environment and health in 2021? The prevailing ethos in 2021 is that it's all about me, not about we. And so maybe it's time for our prevention effort, efforts to focus on all of us, on we. This is the famous prevention triangle. On the top, you see tertiary prevention. This consists mostly of disease treatment. Just below is secondary prevention. Secondary prevention involves things like screening for diseases. Just below this is primary prevention, which includes individual activities to reduce the risk for illness and injury. Things like putting smoke detectors in your home or wearing a seatbelt. And at the bottom of the triangle is what I consider to be the most important aspect of prevention, which is primordial prevention. This is establishing and maintaining the conditions that minimize hazards to health for everybody. A good example of primordial prevention is efforts to stop producing the toxic chemicals that pollute our air, water, or food. And this is all about what we can do together. Environmental health is essentially primordial prevention. These problems won't be changed by quick fixes one chemical or one industry at a time. Just as police violence won't be changed by putting one officer behind bars. We now understand that healthcare accounts for only about 20% of overall health status. 
the other 80% of our overall health is linked to social and structural determinants and ecological determinants, as shown on this slide. We now need to recommit to engaging together on these social, structural, and ecological factors to ensure a healthier future for our children. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Dr. Etzel, uh, and for everyone else uh, for joining us. We have um, 15 minutes here at the end to uh, take questions. So if anybody um, wants to go ahead and type additional questions into the chat box, we can, uh, yeah, we can field them from there. I'll start with some of the ones that have already popped in. Let's have a look. I think going back to some of your earlier slides, there's one, um, uh, Patty Saunders is just wondering, when did those Cleveland cases occur? Um, and then there's also questions about the mold. But yeah, Ruth, when, when did those? Um, when, so when the, the epidemic of pulmonary hemorrhage in Cleveland occurred in the early 90s, quite some time ago. Gotcha. And the, the other question here is, um, is asking about the mold. And so they, you mentioned that they're associated with chronic water problems uh, in the home. And uh, they're wondering if you could explain a little more about that, specifically uh, what, what type of chronic problems. So one of the reasons public health officials ask people to clean up leaks or flooding problems within the first 24 hours is that these very toxic molds take much longer than that to grow. They take at least one to two weeks of chronic um, water damaged cellulose material in order to set up housekeeping. And so we can assure people that if they're able to clean up any leaks or floods within the first 24 hours or so, these very toxic molds will not grow. Fiona Hanley's asking if uh, really is appreciating that uh, that pyramid image there was maybe your second to last slide um, of those different levels of care uh, and, and wondering if that's available with attribution or um, where they might find it. Sure, I actually love the prevention triangle because it always reminds me that most of what we do in nursing and in medicine is way up at the top of the pyramid trying to handle diseases once they've already occurred. But in fact, we could do so much more and be much more effective if we worked at the population level to decrease the pollution before it occurs. And I'd be happy to send ACAT the slide and people can use it as they wish. Yeah, that'd be great. I can include it, uh, update the, the related readings and resources page on our ACAT's Che Alaska webpage and include it in the follow-up email for the recording. Here's another, um, another question here. Um, do you know if there were or are any long-term detrimental health effects or consequences to the, to the Cleveland children? You know, there were um, some uh, doctors who were able to follow a few of the children, but it was very difficult to do a complete longitudinal study. There was some hint that the children who had had exposures to molds in very early life had a higher prevalence of asthma, but the numbers were too small to be really definitive. However, we know from many other studies um, that come from Europe and many other countries that exposure to mold in early childhood is a well-known risk factor for the development of asthma. I'm, I'm, I apologize, I'm sending these to you just as they come in. So we're, we're bouncing around on topics a bit here, but it seems like you're more than capable of fielding it. But another, yeah, Melanie Jeffrey is asking, uh, do you have an example of long latency cancers due to childhood fetal exposure to environmental epigenetic carcinogens? Well, you know, I've been watching the literature on prenatal and early life exposures to pesticides and the development of 
um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And um, it sure looks to me like that literature is becoming much stronger. And so I would say that is one of those long latencies where the exposure probably occurred in utero and we're seeing effects on um, lymphoma and leukemia that are occurring some 10 to 15 years later. And it really uh, makes us realize how important it is that the work that we do with women during and even before their pregnancies to reduce all their chemical exposures can pay off in terms of healthier children and adolescents. Hmm. There's uh, yeah, a few more comments and questions regarding, regarding molds um, and their health impacts. Um, one is saying that it seems like there could be stronger FEMA or floodplain zoning regulations to prevent building homes and businesses in floodplains. So kind of that, that preventative step of yeah, where, do, where are you even constructing these houses? Um, and, and then sort of a, a question along the molds as well, more specifically is, um, is one of the points or one of the, the, the health concerns that arises or impacts is causing cancer. And they're wondering if you could speak a little more about liver cancer um, specifically. I don't know if that's, yeah, one of the issues. So we first really became aware of how important mycotoxins were from studies in Africa where there was a, quite a high incidence of cancer of the liver. And after multiple studies over multiple years, not only in Africa, but also in Asia, it was determined that this high risk of liver cancer came from foods that were contaminated with aflatoxin, which uh, again is one of these toxins that affects grains. And people were eating the grains and when you eat the grain, um, you can't tell that it's contaminated. It, it uh, tastes just the same and uh, often looks just the same. Um, but those studies indicated that it was both exposure to aflatoxin and exposure to the hepatitis B virus that jointly really caused a big increase in the risk of developing liver cancer. And so ever since then, countries have had limits on the amount of aflatoxin that can be um, allowed in various food products because they don't want to ever re-experience what African and Asian countries experience with massive numbers of people with liver cancer. There's a question here. Um, could you speak to other indoor air hazards for children, such as flame retardants and other neurotoxic chemicals? That's a very important question. And we now understand that all of the various products that we use in our homes uh, will end up um, on our carpets and on our chairs and sofas. And um, as our children are learning to crawl and learning to walk, they're getting these things like the uh, flame retardants and, and other chemicals on their hands. And of course, children explore their environments by putting their hands in their mouths. And so it goes from the hand to the mouth and many children get you know, quite excessive exposures to chemicals from normal exploration of their home environments. And there's a lot of research now trying to figure out how to parcel out all these different potential neurotoxins and figure out um, what the effect, the cumulative effect of all these different toxicants that children take in in early life is on their neurodevelopment. And we're seeing signals that um, it's probably harmful to neurodevelopment. Um, we don't fully understand chemical by chemical, but again, this is where I really find it um, uh, not helpful to look chemical by chemical. And instead we need to be saying, let's reduce all the chemicals Let's reduce the production of these chemicals rather than waiting for them to expose our children during their most vulnerable years. And then after we see the neurodevelopmental problems, trying to get them off the market. There's uh, a couple of questions on the theme of um, actions to take uh, 
One is wondering what environmental policies you think could improve these underlying factors, as well as, yeah, more of just to share your perspective as to what actions, uh, you know, us, our listeners can, can take. Um. Um, I guess the thing that I think about most is the holistic view values that are held by the Alaska Native leaders. And um, I continue to force myself to think about these problems much more holistically. Early in my career, I was hell bent on getting individual chemicals off the market. You know, we'd find a case of acrodynia or mercury poisoning and we'd work hard to make sure that mercury got out of the product that poisoned the child. But I now realize years later that if we continue to do that chemical by chemical, we will really not ever be able to make substantial progress. And so I feel like we need to turn off the tap. And the only way the tap of chemicals that pour into our air and into our water and into our food will ever be turned off is if people emerge like they did on Earth Day in 1970 and say, we're not going to take this anymore. We don't want to be pre-poisoned in the womb by all of the things that we eat, drink, and breathe on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I think it takes all of us in all of our organizations to come together and demand this of the leaders of our country. Because um, right now, all of our organizations are kind of balkanized with some working on electromagnetic <laughs> fields and some working on lead and um, if we allow ourselves to be balkanized like this, um, our voice, our united voice will never be as powerful. So I say, if we can only come together, our voice cannot be dismissed. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Axel, for those words. I think that's that's something we can all get behind. The um, here, here in Alaska, one of our pressing concerns is, is PFOS. Uh, as a contaminant in our drinking water. And um, yeah, I, I understand uh, there's evidence about immune system effects and even on the e efficacy of vaccines in children associated with this contaminant. I was wondering if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about um, the research on PFOS and children's health. Well, this is an area that's getting a lot of attention right now. Um, a couple of years back, um, researchers looked at um, the possible effects that these per and polyfluorinated compounds might have on the efficacy of vaccines. And they found that they actually reduced the efficacy of vaccines. And that's a very big deal because of course, during this pandemic, we're all very concerned about improving the efficacy, not only of the coronavirus vaccine, but of all the vaccines. And so this hint that came from researchers in Denmark was something that made people sit up and pay attention. And of course, many others are now working on this, but there are hints and really some very nice preliminary studies that showed that exposure to these perfluorinated and polyfluorinated compounds could affect the children's ability to respond to vaccinations. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm seeing this Let's maybe take one last question here, but the and there's also comments um, about yeah different types of community action and advocating for safer safer chemical use in schools uh, and some effective action that's been taken um, in the chat box. But there's one last question here that we have time for. Um, Helene Alon writes, what recommenda recommendations do you have for communities who are concerned about environmental exposure? For example, um, they live in Southern Oregon where they had devastating fire in the fall and folks are still living among the debris and cleanup. So with respect to fires, boy, there's, there's probably already been a huge exposure to the, the particulate matter in the air during the fire, which is, is really damaging to everybody's respiratory health. And um, during the cleanup, who knows what people might be using to, um, uh, to clean up. Uh, it seems to me that one of the really important things is the use of personal protective equipment. Um, when 
uh, working among the debris and the cleanup and protection from electrocution and, and all of the injury hazards as well that are very important during cleanup from the fires. Well, I'm looking at the time. I've, I've actually gone a minute over here. So uh, we, could, <laughs> we could go on and on, uh, but I do want to thank, I want to thank you, Dr. Etzel. And I want to thank everyone who joined us today. Apologies again for the little audio kerfuffle at the beginning. Um, I will send an email out with a recording of this presentation and conversation um, later today, if not tomorrow, and I'll provide a little list of any additional related resources that came up uh, in the conversation. So just a quick update for Che Alaska. Our next call will be the last Wednesday in May, May 26th, and uh, we'll be joined by a panel of, of experts and, and Alaskans to discuss uh, mercury contamination and the proposed Donnell and Gold Mine in Southwest Alaska. Um, this call will be at a slightly different time, noon Alaska time, and I think we'll probably stretch it out to an hour and a half. Um, but anyway, that'll be in a follow-up email as well. So if you can, please donate to support these monthly Che Alaska calls and ACAT's other efforts. Um, and any additional questions or comments, feel free to email me or call our office at 907-222-7714. And again, thanks, thanks to everyone. And I hope you have a, a wonderful rest of your day.